Great. Are we ready to go? Yep. All right. Uh, well, good morning. Happy Veterans Day. My name's Eric Prosher. I am a clinical psychologist uh, that, um, and a U.S. Navy veteran. I received my, uh, signed off my commission the day before 9-11. I, after uh, my active duty time, I've been working at the VA uh, since 2005. And uh, I work with post-9-11 veterans and trauma recovery uh, services. And uh, before I begin today, I have to say that these are my views and not the views of the VA or the Department <laughs> of Defense. And uh, I have no conflicts of interest. <laughs> well done. And so <laughs> without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce the, the panel panelists and uh, begin the conversation. Um, so, to my left here is uh, Diego Ugaldi. He is a retired Navy SEAL turned CEO with uh, the Trident Approach and Psychedelics Integration Coach for Heroic Heroes Project. And Diego's efforts now are concentrated on coaching high powered executives, athletes, mental health clinicians, and veterans, uh, connecting with the self and leading the mind. And to his left, we have Matthew Wiz Buckley, you can just call him Wiz. And uh, uh, Wiz is a US Navy F-18 Hornet fighter pilot, Top Gun uh, graduate with two deployments to Iraq. He's a former Wall Street executive, best-selling author, uh, Max Afterburner podcast, and chairman, founder of No Fallen Heroes Foundation. Wow, that's a mouthful, all right. Thank you for having me. And then we have Giorgio Kirlo. Uh, we have him back again. Uh, he's a devil dog, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps veteran and uh, advocate for military and healthcare reform aimed at prior prioritizing psychedelics, psychedelic treatment. And he's currently president of Blood, Sword, and Pen Strategic, which is a consulting and ethical fundraising organization. And next to him, we have Dr. Stephen Zanakis, correct? Uh, he's a, a, US Army Brig a retired U.S. Army Brigadier General uh, and Executive Director of American Psychedelic Practitioners Association. Uh, he's a, uh, did I say he was a psychiatrist? And um, with nearly 30 years of active duty experience, uh, retiring in 1998, and uh, he's here to uh, He's dedicated his work to the health and welfare of, of our service members and their families. And last but not least is uh, Dr. Luan Fan. He is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Ohio State University and College of Medicine uh, and uh, the Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Fan studies the neuroscience of emotion, anxiety, and traumatic stress. And his research has been continuously funded uh, for the last two decades by the National Institute of Health and Veteran Affairs for almost two decades. All right. I now think we... it's the Ohio State, right? He forgot the, the, the oh, Ohio oh, State. Oh, oh. Thank you for that the correction, up. Wes. The Ohio State. <laughs> All right, so uh, why don't we just start off, and by the way, uh, we want this to be uh, conversational, so if there are questions in the audience, just raise your hand and uh, throughout the presentation we'll, we'll have the conversation. But uh, why don't we start off with psychiatry and um, continue the conversation that last panel talked about with what are some of the challenges and risks of integrating psychedelic treatment for our veterans in, uh, for mental health and well-being? Okay. So I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, and we'll get this conversation going. Uh, I think that uh, we need to recognize that these medicines now are put us at an inflection point and a major inflection point at a time when we have a mental health crisis across the country for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is that many of us are coming out of this COVID pandemic, and we saw how the pandemic itself really affected the daily lives of everyone. 
in terms of how they could go to work, how could they go to school, how they could socialize, all these kinds of things going on. Uh, we have 100,000 deaths from opioid overdoses in, across the country. We have suicides, 50 to 60,000. So we know that this is a time that, uh, that many of us, many of the people in our communities and families are feeling a tremendous amount of stress and trying to live with it. Now what's happening in medicine? And what's happening that these, these modalities now with, particularly we're a practitioner's group, and we're looking to promote how we can now configure, set up, and provide better treatment with these medications, is they're causing a shift. And they're saying to us, we're gonna go back, I graduated, I, uh, you know, I, uh, it's hard for me to swallow, I graduated medical school 50 years ago. And when I graduated, uh, the white coat and the doctors, it was about the doctors and the patients. There's good things about it, and there's always, as you know, some, some problems with that. The, what followed was there was a sense of, well, now we're just going to talk about the science. And you go see a doctor, and the doctor says, well, tell me about the science first. And it's almost as if the patient is blurred. And that's not right. Because we're here, we have the privilege of being clinicians and helping you. That is a great privilege. For thousands of years, societies have recognized that there are men and women who they will go to and trust to help them. Now's the time for us to bring that back, and we can, we need to, what we can do to bring that back is to now bring to the forefront what is talked about as patient-centered care. Okay. What do the patients need? What are they coming from? What help do they need, and what specifically do these modalities need to do? Well, that's transformational, and we're running institutions have to change. Academic medicine needs to change. The, the industry needs to change. That's a heavy lift. Okay. But the time Dr. Zanakis, let me uh, push back a little bit in the sense that uh, what I hear you saying is very important, right? That uh, medicine in the mo more recent years has progressively become obsessed with what they call evidence-based practices, right? Uh, practices that have been uh, supported in research that, um, that, are, that provide a certain outcome. Um, and you're saying, hey, there's more than just the science. Um, what is the risk of um, rushing the science before the science has shared the important information about what these can offer. So that's veterans. a great question, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's the, the rule? We all live by first do no harm. Mm -hmm. but that's in anything that we do, particularly as clinicians, but in any walk of life. Make mm -hmm. sure we know what we're doing and doing it in a thoughtful way. And uh, the risk is that the way that science is playing out now is flawed. You know, I, we see it as practitioners as sort of a staged act here. The first stage are the RCTs. They're very discreet, sanitized studies. We give MDMA to patients that have a diagnosis of PTSD, and by the way, to qualify, they don't have anything else. Yes. But look at all of us. Are you telling me? That we don't have anything, any other noise going on in our lives and our heads. And the soldiers, that the veterans that in my practice that don't also have a traumatic brain injury, yes. have chronic pain, have maybe picked up some horrible infection someplace, you know, that they're treated me. So the RCTs are okay, but now we gotta go to act two. And it can be done without it seeing reckless. It yes. can be done thoughtfully. It can be done systematically. It can be done methodically, where we bring people in. We've got tools now with, you know, look at how the explosion has been in AI. We have tools that we can bring these out and say, you know, we can really do a study, write a pilot program with real world patients that have real problems in a controlled setting and, and make sure that we pay attention to what might be harmful about it. You just got to be willing to do it. Because if you don't, by the way, which is what 
he was saying earlier this morning, you've got somewhere between 20 and 40 suicides a day. So where's the harm? So, yes. So uh, <laughs> I want to give uh, academic scientist uh, Dr. Luana opportunity to speak as to add to that. Yeah, obviously there's uh, an urgency for better treatment uh, and opening up a menu to offer our patients, uh, including our veterans who are suffering uh, quite a bit despite 20, 30 years of, 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 of search for, for better treatments. Um, I, I guess I, I, I'm a bit of a contrarian in this way, though, right? Because there is a path. Unless, unless there's a new path, we still have to go through the same FDA approval path we still have to go through the same insurance path we have to, have to, to make it accessible to our patients. So my worry actually is if we rush too quickly, it will produce a side of data that will back, will make us as a field backstep a couple of steps before we move forward. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of excitement and, and I'm not sure that all places do it methodologically well. You know, I, I think we want them to all do it methodologically well. We want to push that envelope quicker than, than, than what's there. But I, I do worry about the fact that the more you push it, uh, the faster you push it, it, it might fail backwards. We might take two steps back. I, I'd rather do a great study that proves something that we can put up against everything else that's being prescribed in the clinic. You know, and I think that's going to be the stronger set of evidence. Absolutely. So I, it sounds like everyone agrees that there is a need, right? There's a need out there. And, um, um, and just being careful in a way that it benefits the most people would, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, if you think about everything that we have in psychiatry, psychology now, and, and much more in the psychiatry world, is that we actually don't know how medicines work. Absolutely. Psychotherapy as well. Right? We don't know how they work and we don't know for whom, right? And, 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 and if we continue to go down this path, we'll always be the stepchild of the rest of medicine where they can actually get at a mechanism of action, an active ingredient for why a medicine should be ingested into your body, right? And, and I think that we need to stop doing that. And that's why mechanistic studies for these kinds of medicines are really fundamental to go forward as well. Absolutely. I want to turn to uh, Diego, I mean, uh, Georgia. Giorgio, I oh, know, Diego's right here. Can I, can I just, uh, just, as, just real quick, as a, uh, certainly not as a, a person with a, with a, a medical background, um, I think that one of the things that is unique about psychedelics is, is that they're not repeatable um, experience to experience. And each person will manifest something different each and every single time. I think that from the, um, the benefit effects of what happens in days following the treatment is um, obviously something that is much more um, neural pathways uh, that are firing differently than they were. Um, I think that's something that needs to be studied greatly, but I think that the, um, the hesitancy to um, rush this is um, perhaps gonna be a, a, de a detrimental factor. And, and, and the reason why I say that is the exact number of um, the suicides that we talk about. I think that we are in crisis. I think that we do have some um, results-based studies right now, and, and I will say, um, you know, from the underground, if you wanna go look at a really large in-person study, there's a music festival called um, EDC in Las Vegas. In Orlando. And then there's one in Orlando as well, and um, I recommend you go to it and just look around, and, and I'll be honest, and I, I don't, and I mean this because I went to this music festival, I would never do drugs when, when I went, and I, and I looked around, and, and then um, I think that it's, it's there in, a, in such a grand scale, right under the surface, it's, it's, it's in grand scale in our community right now, um, but, but the hesitancy is, I don't think it's gonna be repeatable person to person. Every single person is going to have a different Thing. And, and I think that in order to license it and ensure it, the problem is, is that you have to know how it's going to work for each person in order for you to do that. And I, and I think that we'll never be able to get there. That's just me in the plant-based side. Um, I, I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to get well, there. I think you bring up a great point. In, in, in other words, the biggest obstacle is that you might be, not be able to arrive at the answer that is expected with the traditional methods and understanding before. 
very, very reasonable thought for sure. And I actually think there's no really great way to do a randomized clinical trial with a placebo control in this context. So therefore, the standard needs to be changed in order for us to push things forward. Right? Yeah, and I would just speak to that. He's talking yeah. about randomized clinical trials that, uh, that are comparing group averages and treat individual differences as statistical noise, right? And that's how they, they work to find a universal response, uh, which is in contrast to what you're saying is, is the individual. We're interested in the individual. We're interested in the unique experience. Diego, do you have anything? What's on your mind? Uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about is one of the great gifts that I've gotten from psychedelics is the release of the need to know. And when I'm looking at this whole idea of, of what our typical approach is, is studies and this type of thing, which are, by the way, conducted by humans, um, I'm recognizing that there's so much of humanity that's missing what is. There's nothing we're going to be able to do to stop whatever psychedelics becomes. It just is going to be. There are going to be clinicians. You get to go. There are going to be clinicians who provide information and statistics to support things for the individuals who need to have that uh, comfort mechanism in order to move forward. But I can say for myself, there are other people who may even just say, hey, what, how is this going to lead me down this path? How can I accept this for just coming into my life? Because stopping somebody like myself or other veterans that I know, just because the, the scientific studies aren't there, we were just talking, so many people are losing. And uh, I think it was Einstein that said, you know, we can't solve the, our, the same problems by, you know, with the same thinking that, that created the problems in the first place. So I think there's absolutely value and room for people who are needing the studies. And to, it, there's value in that. There's no question about it. And there's also value by just letting things be as they already are going to be. Wiz, do you have something to add? I, this is all beautiful. I love being on stage with 500 pound heads and then folks like us who have the experiences. I look at it as a bridge. Uh, on, on one side of the bridge, you got lab coats and, and booger eaters and, and beakers. And then on the other side of the bridge, you got women and men, veterans and first responders telling about their unique experience, right? And I don't know if that bridge is supposed to meet. I personally believe in the middle of that bridge is God. If that word doesn't resonate, put in universe, source, divine truth. But th there's all the anecdotal, this saved my life, this changed my life. And then we, we got these brilliant people over here going, um, how? Maybe to your point, we're not supposed to know, right? I get, you're, you're right, Doc. The FDA ain't going to dig. So let me get this straight, Wiz. You went to Costa Rica. You sat around a fire. A medicine worker felt spirit and poured Iboga into your mouth. <laughs> yeah. And it saved my life and changed my life. I don't think that <laughs> Uncle Sam's going to dig that serving amount or uh, anything like that. But to your point, Doc, we have to find a way. Every, the hour we're going to sit here, one or two veterans just took their own life, or first responder, or a family member. We don't have time to wait. So I, I look at it as a bridge, and in the middle of that bridge, maybe we're not supposed to get there. But it would be awesome to get there. Don't get me wrong. I think there is a way, and there is a, a, a middle path. And um, because the psychedelics is not... As you say, it's an individualized experience, and it's not an end-all, be-all. It's not a, an answer. And people have had psychedelic experiences, as uh, Diego has pointed out to me privately, and they've still committed suicide, right? So the challenge, though, when we imbue a medicine with this power is it engages the fascination of culture and people, and this creates a type of placebo effect. And that's what I'm interested in the, in the neuroscience of placebo effect because so much of our medicine is uh, intermingling of in belief and expectancy um, with the molecule, right? So um, I don't, that's why I would side with Dr. Fon in terms of caution about what it is we know and say to people um, it, because I'd, of those circumstances where 
it doesn't live up to the expectation. So I'd like to, um, since I've kicked us off about this, a couple things. Uh, first of all, they're not exclusionary. Let's understand that good science, good medicine, and doing what we need to do with, for our patients are, are not oppositional. Okay? We are here to take what we know, the science informs good practice, and know that when we have experience with people like you, we learn from that experience, and we think about how the next person that comes through that door needs help, and the knowledge we have from the science is going to inform that. Having said that, we also need to have some humility as scientists and physicians. Irrespective of the aspiration, which I wholly agree to, to understand how the mind and brain work, and unfortunately in Western, Western world, we've put a firewall between the mind and the brain. The fact is, of all the years that people have been doing research, they still don't know, right? You know the fallacies of how the SSRIs were 40 years ago put out, and the fallacies of the pharmacology and the neurophysiology, and we still don't understand why those drugs help. So let's just admit that we don't understand that. And this is not diabetes. There are a host of, of problems that patients have, maybe that in fact we give medicines and do treatments and we don't know how they work. We have studied them. We have figured out what treatment is right for what patient. We've studied and been very meticulous about knowing what the harm is. That's what we can do. Now, we have to also appreciate the fact that it takes 15 to 20 years to take something that we discover and think about to get it into treatment. Well, you know what? That's too long. Absolutely. Okay, that's too many deaths. Absolutely. Okay, to take another 20 years for us to say, oh, now I'm confident I know what the science is. Yes. Okay, my generation that came from Vietnam lost too many men and women exposed to those problems because we were still trying to figure out the science. That's not Didn't responsible. It, in, in Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, I thought I read that penicillin, they discovered it, saved lives in World War II, and not until the, in the 20s they discovered In the 60s is when they figured out how it works, but they were using it while they were still trying to figure out how penicillin worked. Absolutely. I mean, that, but... The RCT is the study designed to dis determine how it works. It doesn't right. tell us why it works. So let's move the conversation forward then, because right now there are five uh, clinical trials going on that are testing us in military and veteran populations. What do our audience need to know? What were your recommendations for what they can do to change it? Right now, in most states, uh, you can only participate in psilocybin or M. M MDMA uh, assisted therapy if you're a part of a research clinical trial or you're, you know, leaving the country or going to Oregon. So what, what do our audience need to know and what are your recommendations to uh, change the system? So I think what we can do is take a page from what we did with traumatic brain injury and uh, where we set up, I was in 2010, advising the, a good friend of mine, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen. And uh, it took the Admiral Mullen to tell the Surgeons General of the three services, we're going to set up the NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. We don't know how TBI occurs. In fact, it took us a while to even admit that these blasts were causing injuries, right? We all, my generation, grew up, you have a concussion? All right, all right, shake it off, kid, and go back on the field. Get another one, and you'll be a mess. Uh, but, uh, so it took the admiral to say, no, we're going to set up the National Trepid Center that the Surgeon General did not want to do. But that ended up being a great model. We were going to bring everybody together, which we did, to have what diagnostics that we knew that we started to explore and work, have treatments there, that we understood could work, and we were going to do it in a really controlled setting. And then from there, it was to, as we saw that unfold, then we started to set up other TBI centers uh, across the military. So we can do this in a controlled way. 
Okay. We, can, we can set up pilots in the VA. I'm not sure how many, what I've seen, and I could be wrong, most of these five pilots are being funded from philanthropic donations. <laughs> They're not being funded by the VA. That's not right. When you've got 4,000 veterans going offshore, you know, then we have a responsibility to take care of them here. And to, we can figure it out. This yeah. is not, you know, this is not that hard. You know, it's the will to do it. I, I agree. But why does that make a difference, though, whether it's uh, funded in side VA, if not, if it's the research is still being done in Because the I think it house. can be expanded. Okay. Okay, I personally think that every, there are 22 visions, I think, still. Yes. I think every vision should have a pilot program. This is a huge yes. problem. Visions are networks in the VA. The networks so. in the VA. I'm sorry to be talking mumbo jumbo. <laughs> but this is the networks in the VA and their little centers and the way they've organized themselves and the way they dance around the campfire. And, uh, but I think each one of these visions, uh, which is a cluster of medical centers, could be setting up their own pilot program. Fund it internally, bring in the people that do that, do it in a, by the way, have a protocol, do it the way we do things in the military, right? You were a pilot, you had a checklist, you know? I mean, we, we know how to do this. Yeah, it's not that hard. It's the will to do it. Absolutely. And I think then the government's got an investment. The government's got to have some, you know, show that they've, they're a part of it, and then we'll say, yeah, this is legitimate. And it'll bring in the other federal agencies, we can bring in the FDA, we can bring in everybody else that's got policies and programs. I don't disagree, as the VA is the largest medical uh, health care system in our country. Um, Diego, what's on your mind? Well, what I'm thinking about is part of what I used to do in the SEAL teams was human intelligence, and we could never really understand what people were really thinking if they didn't open up to us. And the only reason they were going to open up to us is if we had something in it for them. We all know the benefits of this, but going to, to a mechanism that already has uh, roadblocks in the way, it's not about explaining, in, in my mind, respectfully, it's not, it's not about explaining to them the benefits, what this can lead to, whatever. I think we have to look at it from their viewpoint why, why do they have the roadblocks up there in the first place? And what are the solutions that we can give to them so that they say, okay, there is something in it for, I mean, I mean it's just the reality of it. There is something in it for me because just giving them statistics, which are real, just giving them results, testimonials, video testimonies, the numbers that Heroic Hearts Project has for veterans going in there for seeking treatment, none of that stuff is deniable. And they've seen all of it. Okay, that's not working. So now what? If you're starting to talk about saving millions or, or, time or money, what is it that the VA, what is it that the, the FDA needs in order for us to sing the words that they're already talking about that's going to say, all right, we need to get this done. And I don't have the answers to that, but I think that there are a lot of people who do know those specific words that they need to hear, so that it's not about what we care about, it's about what they care about, because ultimately they're the ones who are the decision makers. It's not about talking and just to make noise, it's about trying to make change, and the change is going to only come from, just like the medicine, within them. We can't tell them how to change because it's not going to matter. They're going to have to want to change. So how do we figure out what the narrative is going to be for them to understand, or this is crazy, We've gotta, we actually have to do something about this for ourselves. Maybe Absolutely. Somebody, yeah. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. Yes. Sorry, I'm going first. Um, thinking about the veterans that are homeless, how do we take this to them so we can help them? Anyone? I can walk by them with some things in my pockets and, hey, man, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, we have a lot of veterans that Nobody's are homeless. Nobody's going to stop me from doing that. <laughs> I see them in Los Angeles all the time. I live in San Diego, and I, am, uh, I think I'm at the epicenter of the crisis. I think we have the fastest growing population in the country. Uh, the city local government is... Uh, just completely lost. They're reactive in a way. They're not proactive in any sort of way. So helping a veteran is intervention prior to him ending up on the street, him or her ending up on the street. That's the bottom line. It has to happen. Um, identifying how we identify those people who are in crisis. Uh, one of the nasty words that's not used in the uh, veteran homeless crisis is addiction. Um, I think that the government has a duty 
uh, a higher duty to our veterans who are struggling with drugs and alcohol. Um, frankly, um, in many cases, we could say that systemically they caused it, especially if you consider the cocktail of pills that a lot of these guys and girls get thrown on when they go to the VA network. Um, so if you're fueling the crisis, if your medication is fueling the crisis, and then the, you, know, you end up on the street, um, there has to be a better answer. Now, we do know psilocybin, uh, you know, has been, well, a big study was uh, people that were homeless uh, to uh, quit alcohol. Um, they, use, they use homeless people for that. Um, so, so integrating psychedelics in a homeless response is going to be a really, uh, I'm going to say it's going to be a tall task as well. Um, one of the unfortunate things that we deal with in California is you won't receive funding if sobriety is a part of your treatment if work is a part of your treatment. So um, it's a legislative issue, it's a, it's, a, it's a state issue, it's a state by state issue, and uh, as, as far as the veterans who get caught, um, if you're on the street in Portland, it's way different than if you're on the street in San Antonio, it's way different than if you're on the street in New York. So um, maybe the VA needs to take a much harder look, uh, a much more aggressive approach in how they do their social work and um, I will say, I'm gonna just, one more point to add to this. If a veteran is receiving 100% disability and they're getting that paycheck deposited in their account every single month and they struggle with addiction, the VA is not intervening in a manner quickly enough to prevent them from committing suicide from opioid overdose or whatever they overdose on. And that's a big problem. When you have somebody that is, um, when you have somebody that's living on the street and they get three thousand dollars to deposit in their bank account in the first of the month, um, you see this. Uh, you see this in LA, and I see it in San Diego, and I engage with these individuals. That is taking gasoline and going boom. And it's not just it's not just the veteran. It's everybody around the veteran. It's everyone around the veteran that uh, experiences that. So the VA has to responsibly look at individuals that are living on the street and how they fund the crisis as well. So well, that's, that's not said. a VA issue per se because uh, the VA's hands are tied behind their back. That's a legislative issue that uh, we aspiring politicians like yourself need to yeah. change the rules. I, Thank you. Under underrated Tom Cruise movie. Minority Report. Everybody remember that? They had the Department of Pre-Crime, right? Before a crime happened, they'd get an alert and they'd send that team out. The VA needs the Department of, of Pre-Suicide or Pre-Homelessness. We need to stop this so there are current homeless, right? Well, let, let's deal with them right now, but let's transitioning out of the military, you should get a brief on these medicines, right? Instead of like, yeah, in addition to how to write a resume and how to wear a suit and interview for a job, how about if you're suffering or you have any issues, you can go on one of these healing uh, retreats. So maybe they wouldn't end up homeless. So the military does an incredibly good job of training us to do some pretty awful things to another human being. They do a pretty shitty job of transitioning us back to being a human being. So if we could, and this, this might not go over to, uh, or it might go over well in this audience, Criminals, you want to reduce the rate of recidivism when, a, when a, somebody's being paroled out of a prison? Treat them, man. Show them that they are God does not make imperfect things. Knock the rust off, knock the gunk off, and show them who they truly are, and I guarantee you the prison population, the crimes, the homelessness would be reduced. But we need a minority report, a, de a department of pre-homeless or pre-crime to help solve some of these issues. I think, I think the other stark reality is that none of the medicines in this space are available like we have aspirin and ibuprofen and acetaminophen, right? So besides policy, there also needs to be uh, a grassroots effort for industry to begin to produce these medicines in oral form. I, I think it, so it's, 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 it's like a mo all hands on deck kind of approach that, that's really needed because it's not as if we can walk around with a pill bottle that we can give to homeless veterans or vice versa. Even if we stopped it, we don't have a pill bottle to go around to the clinics anyways right now. So I think that there's a, that's the stark reality of the gap of how and, and when you can produce medicines that can 
be disseminated and scaled broadly, yeah. right? That's, that's you, you can kind of sympathize with uh, Timothy O'Leary back in the day when he said, put it in the water, right? It's a little radical at the time, but I get what he was coming from, right? We could probably heal a lot of people if it was a little bit more widespread. Thank you. Did I take enough everyone's time? Is there one more? We have one more. No? All right. Oh, yeah, yes. One more. Okay, one more. One more. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and I'm partnering with my LPC friend here, and we are in an area of Arizona that has a very high veteran population. And between us both, we have about 40 years of experience. So I have witnessed my peers the majority of them throw meds at people, children, adults, like they were spaghetti and see what sticks on the wall, you know, polypharmacy all over the place. They don't seem to understand the mechanism of action of a lot of the meds that they're using, even though actually in psychiatry we do have somewhat of an idea. And, um, and then the therapy area tends to be kind of what they call eclectic, so missing the mark on how to structurally assist a patient through a quote-unquote diagnosis, whether it's CBT or DBT or ART or whatever. So I love this conversation because we're like the right and left side of the brain, which is what we're trying to do is create that bridge. There's a book called Why God Won't Go Away which talks about how the parietal lobe actually activates for an fMRI machine when people are meditating or praying or, or whatnot. So my question is, on the medical side, having hopefully worked with ketamine, what would you say to a new provider, prescriber of ketamine, like one thing, one piece of advice as we guide our patients and from the experiential side, what is one thing that you would say to our therapist to guide her as she works with the patient so we can integrate? And we will, we will be you know, the ground roots of this movement to help bring the data of actually working with patients. Great question. First of all, thank you for everything you're doing. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it. From the experiential side, uh, in my, in my experience, start with the self. If the therapist doesn't have deep connection to who they actually are, they, they're not gonna be able to get there. If they don't have a deep understanding of the mind, they're not gonna get there with this therapy. Stanislav Grof said, I learned more in four hours of psychedelic medicine than I did in 20 years of psychotherapy. So the bottom line is, if the therapists are not at this place with the people, that's fine but just meet them where they are and walk with them on their path from a standpoint of curiosity. I've heard therapists saying, oh, what you're talking about is dreamland. It's not, they just don't have it in their experience. So get it in your experience, which takes years, not you, just them. Get it in your experience and until you do, walk along with them in a state of curiosity and you'll get a lot farther with these people than otherwise. If you're working with veterans, this is pretty funny because I did, tell our director of medicine operations about this when I first started doing medicine work. If you're working with veterans, try and ditch the word surrender, right? Because um, I'm doing my research about the medicine. They're like, just surrender to the medicine. Surrender, surrender. I'm like, fucking surrendering, man. I don't surrender. Or, or, or uh, Bugsy Malone, Ryan Malone, NHL star right there. We'll drop the glove. So acceptance or, or find another flowery word. It's hard. Don't tell a veteran to surrender to something. Uh, so that, that would be my, if you're dealing with veterans, acceptance, uh, fill in the blank here, but allow, thank you, yeah. Matter of fact, when I, I did 5-MEO-DMT, TOAD, I came up with an acronym, because to, to Doc's point, I'm a fighter pilot, I need acronyms and checklists. It was transcend, open, accept, divine. So that's my TOAD uh, rule of thumb there. So yeah, don't use surrender with veterans or athletes. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, a complex one, right? I mean, even though I'm a psychiatrist who can't prescribe Schedule One medicines, I am actually on the therapy side. And I think that's, that's the really important piece of, of, of going forward as well. But I, I echo what, what I've learned, which is to really be curious and open, that this is a different mechanism than anything that we have on the menu. 
So I, I think that, 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 that's, that those are two key points. And, and I think any time you engage and build a therapeutic alliance with a patient, hope is fundamentally really key. Uh, so I always try to encourage hope um, to, to, to think about that, that you haven't tried this before, be open to it, be curious about it, and it can change how, how you've been working through many, many failed trials before. So that's, I think those are the fundamental things. So we're going to the, we're the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association, and uh, I think that the way to, in, what we feel the responsible way of going forward, answering your question, is we have published professional practice guidelines they're all out there, they're the, and they really try to operationalize what you're talking about, because it's fundamental. They're the next step are clinical practice guidelines. We're going to convene working groups to do that, so that these ideas, these principles, are now codified in a way. People can refer to them. People can feel the practitioners, clinicians can feel confident. The patients can feel confident. And in fact, when we go to payers, or we go to government agencies, we say, there really is a rhyme and reason to what we're doing and why we're doing that. So we, as a collective, I'd ask you to come into our conversations and join. As a collective, we're gonna do this as a team. And we're gonna develop these, and we're all gonna feel, this is what we think of as best practices. I have one tiny thing to add, because we're way over time, I think. Uh, the clinical setting might be a barrier the clinical setting might be a barrier for you. I, uh, I don't feel, I, I think that that might be something that should, we should all talk about from a, uh, prov from a provider uh, perspective, specifically with the experience that we have, nature, or at home, okay? So those, those two things are, uh, I, I really think that coming to go see you is, could be more of a barrier than you coming to see me in my home or us meeting in a group setting or in a, in a place in nature. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.